Hey, everybody, welcome back to Restored to More. We are so excited to have Francie Winslow with us today. We are going to dive into an incredibly life giving conversation. She is doing so much. Charity, tell us about Francie. Francie Winslow. Oh my goodness. First of all, she's a friend and, um, I, and a sister in Christ. And I just feel so blessed that you guys are going to get to know her today. So, uh, in the years following her life was dramatically impacted as she served in mother Teresa's home for the dying in Calcutta, sat in brothels with girls, her age trapped in the sex trade of Chiang Mai slept in the bush of Namibia to reach tribal people and orphans with the gospel of Jesus visited the homes of the poor in the Dominican Republic and helped with the rebuilding and development of a village in Sri Lanka after the 2004 tsunami. Her passion for knowing God and helping others know him is evident, especially in this outreach. Francie has a BA in political science and a master's in evangelism and leadership from Wheaton College in Wheaton. She lives in Northern Virginia and is crazy about life with her husband and their six kids. Francie currently ministers as a podcast podcast host called heaven in your home she is a mentor a writer she has developed a new membership program called heaven in your home discipleship circle and is a speaker for churches and women's conferences welcome francie thank you guys it's an honor for me to be with you i really am so inspired by your marriage your marriage and your hearts for the lord it's a gift to share this time with you Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You've done so much. Yes. Oh my goodness. And you've seen so much. I feel like you have had an amazing opportunity to be exposed to so many things. First of all, would you say like having that much exposure gives you a different, maybe life perspective than you'd say a lot of people have that don't travel or be exposed to the missionary work or things like that? I think so. I mean, it, it started when I was really young. So, mm-hmm. um, I did a lot of that when I was before marriage and young and single. And I think it opened my eyes to clearly like the privilege that we have as living here in America and the freedoms that we have. But also, I think it just showed me God's radical heart for people all over the world and the power of the Holy Spirit to move in so many places and um, really wrecked me for giving everything to Jesus because I realized there's just really nothing else worth living for than the living God who wants to pour out his redeeming love and power into our lives, no matter how rich or how poor you are. Um, So it definitely set the trajectory of my life and um, for sure led me to where I am. Now I'm just a you know, normal mom in a suburb of Washington, DC, but all those things still very much for me and how I'm raising my kiddos. Totally. No, we have such a heart. We have three littles like we were talking about. And I, I grew up doing missions work and going all over the world. And it just, it just gives you a perspective. And I feel like you almost need to like keep going to remember that because it's so easy to get caught up in Western culture. And, you know, we live in an amazing country. We're so grateful for all of the running water we have and the, and all of the privileges that are here. And, and we, we never go without chair. I've never been without. And, and yet you travel around and you realize like, wow, this is not normal. Like this yeah. is a gift and this is a blessing. And I don't, I don't like, and at halftime, I'm just like, kids, I'm taking you to Africa right now. Cause you're going to see how lucky you are to each have your own toy. You know what I mean? And many of them. And it's like, you know, so I, I get that for sure. It's cool that you, have, have done all those things. And are, of course, we're now implementing that with your children and all that too. Yeah. When I went to India, I got connected with um, a girl who was just a little older than me, but she was single and her dad was the minister and pastor. And since then she's kind of taken over and she mothers an entire leper colony wow. in Calcutta and her name's, uh, and so we connected really deeply when I was there when I was 18 and we stayed connected. And so we've been friends for a really long time. And she came and stayed with us for a few weeks before COVID a few years ago. And we have a prayer wall in our kitchen beside our, um, beside our dinner table. It has an appeal to heaven flag, just reminding us like for all things we appeal to heaven. And then it has pictures of people and places because we haven't been able to travel with our kids yet because we have so many and they're so young. Yeah. Um, but we keep saying, okay, this is the vision and we will go there at some point. And i um, just trying to keep that in front of us because we do need that perspective. I think just to realize life is so much bigger than what we're facing in our, yeah. in our day-to-day um, lives here. Totally. What's one of your favorite memories of all the trips you've been on? Do you have, I'm sure there's a lot, but like, what's one of your favorite, like, well, this is one of my favorite moments when I was traveling. I experienced this with Jesus or with somebody. I just love hearing you. 
And well, I, mean, I think one of them question. stood out when I was like 15 and I went to Africa and slept in the bush of Namibia. So I was really young, but the Lord asked me a question, what has captivated your heart? And at the point, it was a really cute boy in high school who, who was, I was dating, it was a Christian band, you know, all the things. And he's, and he's like, what is, what do you think about when you wake up in the morning? Who do you want to be with all day? What do you think about when you go to bed? And I was like, it's that guy. And he said, I want to be that. And that, mm -hmm. I think you having space and margin for intimacy with God invites him to reveal himself in powerful ways that can really change your life. And I think I'm realizing the same thing is for my marriage. A, that question is always the most important. What has captivated your heart? Because if that is in alignment with who God is, everything else will line up in a powerful way. Uh, not that it'll be perfect, but you'll be, you'll be positioned to receive what God has for you. And then the, um, I think the next thing I think about is because I had that margin that summer in that the bush of Namibia to hear from God so clearly and to respond with so much conviction, it showed me that intimacy um, precedes, it follows margin. And we need to give God space to speak to us. And it's the same thing as I look at our sex life now and speak like changing speeds a little bit, but our marriage and our intimacy in our marriage, we have to have margin for it. And with six kids, it can feel always like, oh, we're so breathless running after all things life. But creating margin for intimacy, I think, is what I learned young and what I'm applying now to my marriage, too, that they're very connected, that the marriage bed and the marriage relationship is a metaphor and very much revealing of God's heart. And that margin is such a huge thing to reveal the bigger parts of God's heart to us and the bigger places of healing that he has for us and carving out that space to say, Lord, show up in my love life, in my intimacy with you and in my marriage so that I can actually encounter your heart and not just be going through the motions. Wow. Mm -hmm. So good. Uh, since you brought that up, um, I just want to ask you right now, but yeah, you have six kids mm -hmm. and I, there's something that I, I want to ask later, but you talk about how there is weariness right in our life mm. and how that um, can deplete us from not having sex. And I would love for you to um, talk about that a little bit. Like, how do you make time for it and why it's important to make time for it in a busy season of your life? Yeah, man, it's so true. So when, um, my two oldest, they're like 16 months apart. So they were like back to back. We were so exhausted when we had those two little guys and I was getting my master's degree and why it was traveling salesman felt like we just passed babies back and forth. We're high five in it was really clear that we're becoming roommates and we, but neither of us wanted that. We had had a great start to our marriage, really wanted to be strong, but we were just drifting. And I think the drift is so automatic if we're not ruthlessly intimate, ruthlessly intentional with growing our intimacy, with thoughtfully growing it, with thoughtfully investing in it, with practically putting tools in our hands and in our minds and in our mouths to actually grow will drift. And so we were feeling the drift and we decided at one point, we just put a stake in the ground and we said, we are going to intentionally prioritize intimacy. And for us, what that looked like, it was messy and kind of um, odd, but we just said, we're going to have a date night every night because we were having a hard time finding a babysitter and we were having a hard time getting everybody, you know, somebody's always sick. It was all of that. So we decided instead of trying to go out to dinner, oddly, you know, like here and there, we would just hunker down every night together and invest that time. And so I think that was the beginning of us cultivating a really intentional habit for intimacy. And it wasn't like we had to have sex every night, but we were connecting together without phones and without technology together every night. Some nights we would um, play. I heard you guys in your story, you like play a card game. I heard a podcast where you talked about that. I think that's so great. Like we would play a card game. We went through seasons of trying to um, go through different teachings together. We took an online class together. We would do wine tasting or tea tasting. It was like every year we just kind of did something different for eight to nine times so that it kept fresh and we kept enjoying each other. And every like we would actually make schedules of like, hey, let's have sex this many times a week when we felt like we were drifting or we really just wanted to prioritize more physical intimacy because while physical intimacy isn't the like all all, it definitely opens up doors for other intimacy as you're growing. And so we would prioritize physical intimacy. Um, but I think it has looked as the kids have gotten older, it's looked different because it used to be we'd put everybody down at you know 7:30 and we could start our, our date night, but now we have kids up till 10 o'clock and we're tired. So it looks different, but I think in all, it's just taken intentionality. Another fun way that it has looked as they've gotten older is that we have done um, 
kind of quarterly getaways where we don't go far because we have so many kids and we've had so many um, vacations squashed because people get sick. Um, and so we would just say, hey, when the time comes, we're going to get a babysitter and we're going to look on Priceline that day and see what hotels available or what Airbnb is available. And we would um, just go for a night or two. And if you even don't have that, we have talked, we have found um, in the last two years, the power of date days at a hotel. So I'm giving you like various ways of intentionally making time and room because we are weary, but once we say yes, and once we start leaning in, our bodies and our emotions have space to follow, but it's kind of that first step of how do you make room? And the hotel days literally are like, we call a hotel, and we're like, do you have a half day rate? We'll be there at three and we'll check out at eight. And it just gives us enough time to take a deep breath. Sometimes we get in that hotel room and we pass out and we just sleep for an hour. And sometimes we will take a shower or we'll do different, you know, different ways of winding down, whatever it is, but it usually ends up being a great chunk of a time that feels like a tiny vacation when we didn't even go away for the night. We just went to a different setting. It was quiet. It was private. And we were able to connect physically, emotionally, maybe we'll watch a movie. We'll get order into a hotel and we'll just kind of have this extended date night. So it has looked like a ton of different things in different seasons. Um, but I would say that weariness is for sure I read somewhere recently that exhaustion is one of the biggest barriers to intimacy, especially when you have little kids. And that um, for me, I found that I just need to really remember that and be conscious of that. So that what I'm hearing when I say, no, I don't really feel like connecting is actually exhaustion, not my heart. Mm. And when I take that next step and say, hey, babe, I need a minute to switch gears. Or so many times we, neither of us have felt like connecting intimately, but we choose it because we value connection. And we know that sex is a gift from God to bring greater bonding, greater intimacy and greater breakthrough. And so we say yes to it. And we never, we never regret it when we're both wanting intimacy. We're wanting to grow our marriage and we choose that over vegging out on our phones. It's always a win. Mm. Come on. Wow. Wow. You said and so, yeah, <laughs> you said <We're>, so. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> Stay tuned next time. <laughs> That's so good. And I just, as I'm thinking, there's so much of that that relates directly to our relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. This is why he created Sabbath, right? So that we would rest because we know that busyness prevents us from closeness with yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And we're so busy. And I think there's so many technological advances that have happened mm -hmm. that are incredible. My gosh, we had a need. I got on Amazon. I bought it. It was there. It was there the next day. It was great. It was awesome. But there's so much of that quick hits, whether it's yeah. social media and it's all these things that we realize that I'm losing touch with the Lord. I'm losing touch with my spouse because we're so busy. And I think what I fall prey to personally is I think if I can just get these things done, mm -hmm. then there yeah. will be rest. Then, then I'll be, then I'll have peace. I just need to go replace the faucets, finish the backyard, finish the, dinner, get, weed the, weed that, cut the grass, come inside, clean the house, start dinner, get dinner on the stove, eat dinner, get this going. Okay. Then I'll relax. But, but I also have three little kids that are, that they have, they have decided that it is their personal goal in life to make another mess while mom and dad are cleaning up one, they're like, oh my gosh, you guys, you clean up our mess. We have to take it upon ourselves to make another one because you're not allowed to not be constantly cleaning or doing laundry or dishes or something. And so, and I just hear what you're saying. And I'm like, that is so good because you have to be intentional. It will not just happen. I think rest doesn't even just happen. I mean, these days people our age and younger are staying up until who knows when, because we're binge watching our shows and we're staying up on our phones. And after our show's done, we, we walk like 20 feet to our bed and we pull out our phone. And then after, our, you know what I mean? And so all of a sudden we know it's like one o'clock in the morning. And so we just have a consistent exhaustion yep. because we're so, our life is so full of yep. activities. And I yep. just love what you said, because it absolutely pertains to marriage and it pertains to our relationship with Jesus. That if we're not intentionally taking times to rest and just pause and insert into our calendar the the caption that says nothing and that's like blocked into our time you know what i mean like if we're not doing that it's not going to happen yeah yeah unplugging and rest is almost it's counterintuitive in our world now but it's exactly what we need and what our marriages must have why and i've been talking about it a ton recently just dawning on the truth if your marriage does not have margin it will not grow 
-hmm. I think that has to be true because margin is what is required for growth. Otherwise you're just running and reacting and reacting and reacting. And it's the margin it's the stepping back. I'm going to intentionally unplug. I'm going to intentionally shut our bedroom door and leave our phones downstairs to create margin. And that attention is the most highly sought after commodity these days, our eyes, our focus, our attention, but also the attention of where are we going to place our attention is that yeah. just what you're saying. And um, God designed our marriages to be a place where fruit comes from, not just the fruit of babies, but this overall fruition of he blessed the body of a male and a woman and a female and said, come together. It's a good thing. I celebrate it. Be intimate, be one, be fruitful, multiply and take dominion. Mm. And so it's, it's more than even our happiness, our satisfaction, in our marriage. It's our call to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth through our embodied existence meaning we have a marriage for a reason. We have bodies for a reason. It is to be inhabited by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and deliver the life of Christ around us. And if you're married, you're called to that fruitfulness, to host him, to be transformed by him together and to be fruitful. And that was his dream was that two becoming one would lead to fruitfulness and dominion on the earth. And the enemy wants to do everything he can to distract us yeah. and to bring division. And we all have testimonies of how we've walked in brokenness and he's our healer. And so as we steward that healing and as we steward the redemption of God in our lives, it does require attention and focus so that we don't just survive, but that we take dominion, we take ground and we extend the life and hope of Christ through what I call the ripple effect of sex, that it's way more than sex. It's how the intimacy of our marriage then bears fruit for our children our careers, our churches, our communities, and shifts the culture around us because we are focused on true intimacy. I want to ask you a question, Mother Francie, about, you know, going back to sometimes it's so good to understand the basics. And we have a lot of people that, I mean, I, Chair and I are so drawn to going super deep with you. And I feel like we could lose half our audience. Like, what are they talking about? But one thing that I think we all, and I don't know if you and your husband experienced this, but when you start creating that, that being, right, that moment, it's almost like, what do we do? Like, I remember Chair just like looking at each other like, okay, we've created space. So, mm. and it's so easy to go watch a movie because now our attention is off of each other and onto something else. Not that watching a movie, of course, is a bad way to, to bond and have fun. I think that's great, especially when you're watching The Chosen. But, uh, but you know, <laughs> what is, but for me, I guess my question was, what do you suggest to couples that are just starting to be around each other and create that space and just have a hard time. Like we're just looking at each other and I don't know what to do. Like it's so hard not to talk about our to-do lists or our, our negative emotions. And all of a sudden it's like the guys like, this is not fun. Like, I do not want to do that because it's just my wife vegging to me or venting to me. And you know what I mean? What is that? What do you suggest for couples who are having our time getting started with that? Yeah. Well, I think taking it easy and finding something you both enjoy. And I think we have had series where we've watched tons of like Bear Grylls series or the West Wing, and we've kind of like gone through a big series together. But then we come to a point where like, really, there's nothing else worth watching. You know, yeah. we'll try and we're like, this is just not encouraging to us. It's we're in like fast forwarding through scenes. And what are we doing really? And so I think in those seasons, we've realized the power of having hobbies outside of each other. And so when you come back together, you get to update each other on, hey, I'm learning about this, why it's really into politics. He's really in economics and governments and learning about what's happening around the world. And I don't know anything about that. And I'm he over here at learning about other things. And so us coming, I'm more of like theology. And so I will come to him with like new theology I'm learning. And um, we try not to talk about our kids and we try not to talk about our calendars. Those are two like big things we don't talk about when we want to connect because we were literally just this week laughing about, uh oh, we're having a calendar conversation. Okay, yeah. we're, up, we're okay, we're good, because it's not life-giving to our marriage connection. It's more like the to-dos, but it doesn't build that intimacy. And it's a part of real life, but I think find, remembering, okay, my hobbies are worth investing in. That's also a part of self-care and growth and stewarding who you are and growing that. But I think the other thing fun is to learn something new together and say, hey, we took a great courses class. It's kind of like a master class that's offered now. Let's invest in ourselves as a unit let's learn something new together we uh, love we live in dc so we love to go to museums together and then we'll like chat about the things that we learn in the museum we're kind of geeks i guess we're like learners but um i think finding games to play together that are not intense that are not uh too much thinking if you're exhausted yeah. but i do think you're right i think once you get together what do we talk about and we were made as humans for growth 
So figure out the things you want to grow in, grow together, grow independently, celebrate that with each other and just focus on ways to have fun together. Physical uh -huh. activity is also a great tip of just take a walk together, take a workout class together, do things with your body that uh, you know you can develop together and enjoy and laugh together. Those are so great. Good. Um, okay. I really want to ask you a question uh, that I heard you share on your podcast and it was so good. And I want our audience to hear it. Um, you talk about five lenses that form our sex view. Can you share what those five lenses are? Sure. Okay. So they um, are five W's. And the first one, the way I think about it is that we all have this like sex glasses on because we were born sexual. Nobody, it's not like you get married and some, suddenly you become sexual. Everybody's born sexual. You're born with a gender, you're born with a body, you're born with genitals, it, you're born with a brain and it's all connected and it's all good. So if you're getting uncomfortable, even with those words, just know it's all good. There's no shame. God designed it. It was actually his idea. He's not surprised by it. And so we all have a way of seeing the gift of sex and maybe we don't see it as a gift right now, but we all have a way of seeing sex and I call it a sex view. And it's kind of like a pair of glasses and it's your lens through which you're looking at this thing of sex. And so the world is one obvious one. We see it through media, through um, pornography, through movies, through music, through lyrics, all the ways that the world thinks about sex, talks about sex, portrays sex. And it forms us to think this is normal. This is good. This is what beautiful is. This is what romance should look like. And we begin to think like the world. And we know what scripture says, do not be conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed with the renewing of your mind. So we can understand pretty simply what the world sex view would be. Um, another sex view I often find, I've experienced all of these, but one is the whispers of the church. And for, I know a lot of young women, at least that I've connected with, if you grew up in the church, you hear a lot of whispers about sex, but no clear words, no great celebration, no heralding of God's good design, but you hear people whisper, you hear them whisper behind their husband's back, you hear them kind of giggle in a derogatory way where you begin to believe the lie that sex is dirty and it's a duty. And you might think it's fun when you're young, but when you get old, you're pretty sure that it's dirty and it's a duty. And so those whispers were really um, formative to me because I didn't hear any clear communication about sex. I just knew that it kind of has this dread to it. And so nobody actually taught me on it. I just received that. So you can receive very clear worldview by whispers. Um, oftentimes in the religious circles, sadly, the wounds is the third W oftentimes our, we look at sex through the lens of our wounds and pain that we've experienced. And we know that that is such a trap because that keeps us from stepping into the truth of God's healing and his goodness. If we just see sex through, this is my wounding. Therefore, sex is bad. It's not for me. I will never enjoy it. I will never find pleasure. We live disconnected from God's healing invitation for us. Um, and the last negative W would be weariness, which we've already talked about so many times, especially after kids come into the picture, we are just too tired. And so we begin to see sex through the lens of weariness where we say, we don't have energy for it. It's just, let's pass. And over time with that sort of passivity towards the gift of sex, the weariness really robs us of our intimacy. And so it's something to be aware of, but it happens really subtly. The fifth W, which is the, the best, the bedrock, the foundation is the word of God. And that was my journey is that I was formed by the world, by whispers, by wounds and by weariness. And then I realized God has more to say to us and it's in his word and it's studying the meaning and the connection and the significance of our body and that God made us good, that he made us for pleasure. It was his idea to give a woman 8,000 nerve endings on her clitoris and a man 4,000 and nerve endings. So there's like this massive celebration of pleasure and there's no shame in that. Mm -hmm. He made it good. He called it good and he marked it as his own. And so the last 15, 16 years have been my journey in understanding God's word on the gift of sex, understanding the gift of sex through a worldview that doesn't have like religious negativity to it, but it's actually word-based Holy Spirit given truth that set me free. Wow. I amazing. love those lens. They're so good. And you could talk about each one like so in depth, but I relate to each one of those. Like all of those have made an impact in my view of sex. Mm. And one thing that I heard you share, which I think is so healing is, you know, there's women here who are listening to our show and, and they have trauma, you know, and, um, specifically in their marriage and they don't know how to move past um, becoming sexually intimate with their spouse. And one thing that I loved that you shared, um, in a podcast is you said to 
specifically pray and bless your body every night and, and have your husband affirm, you know, maybe one thing every night of, you know, of your body. And, and I just think I would love to hear you kind of talk about that a little bit and, um, how that can really bring healing to those wounds that you talked about. Yeah. Well, I just first want to honor anybody who is listening, who does feel that rising up of, um, you feel like your neck is starting to break out, or you feel that heart race of that physiological reaction to trauma and pain, because it's real. And I want to honor that and value you in your journey, where you are, where you've been, and just say, we're all on a journey and God is the redeemer who sees us where we are and also calls us forward into a healing that he has made a way for. And so if you are struggling or you feel heavy or you feel confused or burdened by this, it is so worth it. I know you guys would agree to reach out to trained counselors, especially trauma-informed counselors who understand the body-brain connection. But I do think that um, there are practical, very simple things that have helped me that I would love to share. I think one at very first year of our marriage, I had so much shame about my feminine body, so much shame. And I didn't even have capital T trauma, but it was enough that I felt like it was dirty. It was icky. Why would I, why would my husband want it? And I just could not give it freely because I wasn't receiving the gift freely. Mm -hmm. And so I I didn't know that it was a gift from God. And so then I didn't have it to give away, even though I I was showing up, but it wasn't this celebration or this confidence. It was um, something I really needed to be free from. So I just told Wyatt, by the way, our words have the power of life and death, Proverbs 18, 21. So when we speak and we speak life and hope and truth, things literally anatomically shift in our bodies and in our brains and it's powerful. And so I asked him, would you speak, tell me what you like about my body until I believe it. And so I needed him to tell me not just once, not just a couple of times, but consistently. And I said, I hope I'm not being needy. I'm not trying to be needy. I just can't believe it when you tell me that I'm beautiful. I can't believe it when you tell me that part of my body is beautiful because I don't feel it and I don't like it. And I want to be able to give it, but I don't really connect with it. And so it was really precious. He, he spoke love and kindness. He's like, I love, I love your ears. I love, it wasn't even all sexual. It was my head to toe, what he loved about me and what he saw that was beautiful that night. And then later I learned the spiritual power of me coming into agreement with blessing my body, that it wasn't just something somebody else could give to me, but I had to come into agreement with the truth that God said, I'm good. And to be totally honest, I'm now raising little girls and I'm a teenage girl and it's coming again. Lord, help me to believe that my body is good because I can't give it to my daughter if I don't believe it's good. Mm -hmm. And so I've had, it's like another level of renewal that I am blessing my body as I go through stages of womanhood and motherhood, realizing all the more, you know, maybe after you have a baby, you have to have another layer of confidence with the Lord. Like, Lord, you made my body to produce life. It doesn't look the same as it did before. And that is good because I'm a life giver and I'm an image bearer in that way. And so oftentimes if I'm struggling with shame, I'll recognize it as that, take that thought captive and just say, Lord, give me the truth about how you see me. And I'll say, thank you, God, for my body. Thank you for these strong shoulders that carried around my babies today. The arms that hold my little guy as I was rocking him to sleep, this tummy who's birthed six children or carried six children. And uh, we had one miscarriage, but anyway, just remembering the goodness of God through my body and knowing that I have power, not only to ask for help for my husband, who's designed to wash me with truth, but also to stand against the lies of the enemy over my body and my beauty as an image bearer and to speak blessing over my body um, privately. And I I do that regularly. And I'm continually learning that as I do that, I then have something to give away to my daughters. That's very needed. And so it's worth doing in every season because God has more and more freedom for us. Mm -hmm. There's so much freedom when you can let go and release those just shame that the enemy is holding and the strongholds. And you can realize like, no, that's not who I am. That's not, you know, how God designed me. And there's so much more freedom and embodiment and vulnerability. When you come to your husband, you say, I am not ashamed of this anymore. And um, that's how God intended it. It was naked and unashamed. And um, you will get there if you, you know, do certain practical things, but I think that is a really, really helpful tip. And I know it's going to bless a lot of women. Yeah. I think it's so cool how there's so much there. And, and I know that the majority of our listeners are women, but I think there's definitely some men in there that are, are listening to our podcast. And I just want to affirm what you said. I know that you, Francie, mostly, I think, speak with women. I love hearing all that you're doing. And it's almost like just sitting on your couch. Like I just picture when I hear your podcast, 
I, I'm on your couch. I'm like, that was a great couch. You know, I have my water sitting there on your table and my coaster and I just can be there. And I think it's so important that guys are hearing the same message because when you share, I think most guys have such a brokenness when it comes to their sexuality. And then we've been formed by, by those W's that you talk about. I mean, we grew up looking at MTV and seeing these pop stars and that's what sex is. And sex is frequent. Sex is with girls that look like this. Sex is gratifying when it's in this way, right? It, it, it's used as a tool. Women are, are this, they're, 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 they're a means to an end. And we portray that into our wives when we get married. One of the, one of the saddest things is that happens so much is that, you know, we are taught as Christians that sex is going to be this way when you get married. And it's almost like, wait, who was who saying that it was going to be like, you know, all the videos and the movies that we saw, because those were worldly mm -hmm. views of sex. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens is we, as guys, we have so much shame over sexuality, not only yeah. over our own bodies, but even over what we've done as young men or the promiscuous relations we were in or the ways that we hurt women's hearts growing up, the ways yeah. that we used, uh, we used um, even, gosh, I'm, I'm so guilty of using the Christian world and a worship leader and a spiritual leader to, to date girls. And so when you, when you bring that into the marriage covenant, it is really hard for us to rewrite the narrative that sex is a gift, that sex is good, that our sexuality is good. And, and I love what you're saying because we can be washed by the word of God and we can understand that all those things we were exposed to, we can't change that. But what we can do is we can redefine it and we can redefine what we were taught versus what the reality really is. That all those things that we saw were pseudo joy. It was a pseudo experience it was a pseudo intimacy. And that's what I hear you saying. And I just want to say to the guys, like, I think what you're saying doesn't just relate to the women. And I hope that if a guy, if a guy tuned out during what you said, I wish you'd go back and hit the rewind button because I think if we really think about, well, how does what you just said pertain to my life and apply to my life? It's it, you just put the golf ball right on the tee. Like, and you hit it. And those are things that I'm like sitting here like, man, I'm so challenged. And I think even just to add to what, what we were saying, we are given such a responsibility. This is why I think men are just, man, the more we pour into men is so important because God has equipped us and will equip us to be the leader that he's called us to be. And it's not just a leader financially. It's not just a leader, uh, you know, providing a roof over our family's head and, you know, being that, but as a spiritual leader to, like you said, to wash our wives, to purify our wives and to set an example for our children. And when we do that, I believe we are living out so much of Christ's call as a husband and as a father that we are not only just walking with the Lord in our own walk and going to church and being in a men's Bible study, but really how much is that coming out in our relations with our wife to where we are able to celebrate our own sexuality and then celebrate her body in a way yeah. that honors Christ and in a way that literally points our family to Jesus through our yeah. actions. And I just was like, man, what you just said is a huge, I was challenged by what you just said. It was a huge call. And I was a conviction. I was like, man, I got to get better at that. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, it's a, it's a gift. I will say that we're 16 years into our marriage and God is still, it's been good and it keeps getting better. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that there haven't been deep lows, mm -hmm. but it's in traversing the deepest, darkest valleys that we ever didn't even know were possible to be so dark that we've continued to lean in and prioritize intimacy when it was almost unthinkable. But we just kept saying, Lord, we're showing up to you. We're showing up to each other and we're prioritizing connection. We're leaning in that we found that God just keeps healing us. Mm -hmm. And even yet we were on, I shared this with charity in our little private group the other day, but we were, we've taken a couple of very long walks for dates. This is another thing. Like we walk for hours and, um, cause we're kind of tired of restaurants. And so we'll just walk and walk and walk. And the Lord has healed both of us almost spontaneously as we're walking of deep seated lies where I, the enemy was attacking my beauty and his strength. And honestly, his strength was being under attack with his sex drive and the enemy telling him lies about his strength and wanting to feed lies of um, inadequacy and insecurity and me being able to say with my words as a wife, I love your strength. And I love, you know, sex drives is another conversation for another time. And they've waned, they've 
gone high and low in both of us, just given where our bodies have been. But I love your drive. I love that your body points outward by God's design, like the image bearing quality of a man's body is and takes initiative. And I love that. Mm. And I love your strength. And I love that you have this desire for me that is unique. And as I was saying that he just touches heart. He's like, I think the Holy spirit just healed me of something so deep. And it's not a new conversation, but it's more and more and more. God wants to heal the man's strength and the woman's beauty, because that's how we image him. It's how we reflect him and naked and unashamed. We are beautiful and strong and I'm strong and beautiful. And he is handsome and strong, but at our core, I'm beauty and he's strength. And that's the image of God. And when they come together, we see God more beautifully, more powerfully, more magnificently. And that's the whole goal, no matter where you are in your journey, is God continually healing you. And our, our sex keeps getting better in terms of pleasure and depth and meaning and beauty and naked and unashamed keeps getting better because we keep getting more healed. And so it's so worth it. The lies of the world are so big lies. Sex is not what Hollywood says it is. It's way better. It's yeah. way more beautiful. It's way yeah. more meaningful. It's way more supernatural. Yeah. And it is so that it's that because it was God's good idea and his good gift to humanity as a way to see what he's like. And so I just want to encourage you in your journey, wherever you are, that showing up continually to God, continuing to seek his heart, continuing to say, what lens am I looking at? I'm going to take that one off and put on the word of God. Cause the old lenses get back on really fast, oh, yeah. but knowing what is my lens right now and continuing to look to him and the Holy spirit is delights in healing us. He delights in bringing people along our path. He delights in spontaneous healing when we didn't even know we needed it, but through intimacy, through our hearts being open to him and each other, he continually makes us whole and it's worth fighting for. Amen. Amen. Beautiful amen. picture. I love getting my glasses and they're like dirty. Mm -hmm. And I get like my little lens spray and I get my little spray and my little microfiber cloth and I, and I wipe them and it, I put them on and it's like a Such whole a new world. It's like, Whoa, like look at the depth of the colors and the light. And you don't even realize how dirty they get over time and they get dirtier and dirtier. Analogy. And I feel like that's yeah. what you're saying is we have to do that constantly. I don't just clean my glasses one time. I come, mm -hmm. almost every couple of days, you know, they're dirty again. And I think like that's what you're saying. And it's okay. Don't get mad. I think a lot of guys, yeah. we get dissatisfied and discontent and how much work life is and things like this. But this is a good work. That's what I hear you saying. Don't get mad that you got to clean your glasses again and again. We're human. And we live in a world that is con consistently bombarding us with their agenda to, to take the, the word of God and to distort it. And you're saying, hey, it's going to get distorted because we're, we live in this world. But it's our job to just continually refresh and, and, and refresh that, that browser so that we can have a clear view of yeah. God and of ourselves. Yeah. Appreciate that. It's good. Yeah. And that's full circle right back to the margin, creating margin for God to speak, for intimacy to grow with him and each other is where you realize, oh, dang it, my glasses are dirty again. But without that margin, you're not even noticing. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So, so true. It's a great analogy. I love that. That even the smell of that spray is so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, I can see clearly again. <laughs> so refreshing. Um okay, I am like dying for your I want to, I want to, I want you to talk about this, um, before we run out of time. I know you're really passionate about raising up the next generation to understand God, um, healthy sexuality, gospel centered sexuality, the design for sex, uh, cause our world is doing, they want to be louder than us and they yeah. want to be louder than God. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know you're passionate about this and, um, I get passionate with you. So can you just like talk about that and, and how you educate your, your kids and yeah. Yeah, well, this is probably enough for a whole nother episode for sure, because our kids deserve it mm -hmm. and they deserve us thinking thoughtfully and deeply about it. And maybe even what hinders us from wanting to have these conversations. I think there are a lot of great books out there on talking to the, your kids about sex, like the birds and the bees. There's great resources and I have used a lot of them. I find that what's more important than even the sex talk is creating a sexual worldview for our kids, kind of like a sex view. Um, on a kid level, but it begins with our bodies and it begins with the theology of our bodies that we're image bearers and that our houses are like, our bodies are like houses for God, that he wants to live in us and move through us in everything we do. And if a child understands that when you get to the topics of sex, sexuality, gender, you can insert so much truth with so much ease that it makes the sex talk, not a big deal. 
because they realize that their bodies are theological and they're not matter to be discarded. They're not matter to be used and abused. They're matter. They are gifts from God that are to know love and show love. And so that's my, my journey as a mom is taking this theology of our bodies and applying it to my little people as young as toddler. They're not too young when they're toddlers. It's the perfect age to talk about the power of being an image bearer and how God reveals himself through you that you know God and show God in powerful ways. And I'm constantly pointing out how Romans 120 is so true that we see God's invisible natures through the things he's created. And so constantly like, did you hear those cicadas? They're calling for their mate. They're looking for their husband or their wife. Or did you see that ladybug? Did you see the detail of God's design on that ladybug? And um, right now I'm actually taking all of my girls through an anatomy series because I think too often we shy away from understanding our physical anatomy, especially our reproductive anatomy. And I think that caused me great shame. I did not know anything about my body. Even after I got married, my husband's like, how does your period work? I don't know. I don't know why. I just hate it. It happens every month. And that is shame-based because it was silence from the church, silence from, you know, my role models. And so I didn't know. And I want to give my kids not only I want to give them the sex talk, but I want to give them a theology to hold all of it from the time they're toddlers till the time they die, because life is more than the sex talk. It's about how we live embodied as temples of the Holy Spirit and glorify God with our bodies in every stage. And when we do that, we realize more clearly the gift of being an image bearer as male and female, that being a boy and a girl is good. And that there are specific reasons why God created gender, not only to make babies, but because he is both father God. And he also compares himself to a mother who wants to spread her wings over her child or, or make her babies content on her chest. And so we see God is not male or female. He's above gender, but he created gender to reveal what he's like. And so all of these conversations are really important to have with our kids, but they can happen in such simple ways when we realize that um, we can see God's glory through his creation, the birds and the bees, all of it. We can always look and see, isn't God great? He made the mountains. He made the sky. He made the stars and he made you and he made your body and he called it good. And so there are some children's books. I can send you the link to them that I have used. They're actually Catholic because the Catholic people, Catholic scholars have mastered theology of the body before the Protestants. Mm. And so they have this powerful theology of the body that has deeply shaped me. And there are some toddler books that talk about the celebration of our bodies and the meaning of our bodies and how our bodies speak. Um, and how God basically reveals himself through, if you see a person with a sad face, they don't have to tell you they're sad but you can go and speak to them words of comfort because their body's speaking to you. And in the same way, what you do with your body, your soul is speaking. Mm. And so it, it delves into sibling relationships, how we love with our hands, what are our hands for, what are our eyes for, what are our ears for? All of it is God's good gift so that we can know him intimately and show him powerfully. And um, so, yeah, I have those Theology of the Body books for kids that are more Catholic, which I'm working on some projects to make that content and access more accessible to all sorts of background of people. And um, I also, I brought these because I thought you guys might ask me, but you can link to them. They are not Christian. They're not any sort of religion uh, affiliation. They are just science and they are anatomy. And I'm finding it to be cool. so powerful to show my girls wow. the reproductive system in a precious and innocent foundational way. So you're, you're a little young for this. Your kids are a little young. The youngest one I have starts at age five, but it's, I'm a girl, special me, and it's my changing body. How are boys and girls different? And then there's ones about hormones and they are so powerful because as a believer, I can then say, God made all of this. Isn't it awesome? We don't have to be ashamed about any of it. You can talk to me about all of it. It gives great guidelines for how to protect your body and your, your beautiful parts that God made good. And so you can kind of weave into your, your faith into it. But I think the biggest tip I would give is take one step at a time to educate yourself, knowing that your body's good, knowing that you can't give away what you don't have. Let God do the healing work in your life and then walk that out with your kids. That means you don't have to share all of your dirty laundry with them, all of your big stories, but be open and say, I'm on this journey to loving my body because God called it good. And I want to help you do the same. Mm -hmm. And then God will provide step by step and God willing, I'll be able to publish in the next year or so some children's books that 
um, I believe will be helpful, but that's, it is my heart. I'm passionate about seeing marriages transformed and whole and healed and fruitful and abundant and moving forward in the kingdom, but also how do we take this and give it to our kids in a way that we didn't have it so that they can grow up with uh, truth in their hearts and their minds about who they are, girl and boy, image bearing, so that they don't have to be ashamed like, like I was. Wow. So good. I've heard you talk about this in our private messages and I'm just, I'm learning from you. I'm challenged with you and ex specifically with image bear and being an image bear. And what does that mean? And not even just like sexually, but I mean, this sounds silly, but I've even taken that to the next level with like my eating and not overindulging because I'm like, I realized like, wow, this isn't just apply sexually. It applies in all aspects of my life that my body is a house of God and how am I treating it? And it's changed even, I know this sounds so silly, but when I was a little girl, my dad would always say, we're not listening to the song because of the lyrics. And I was always just like, and, and he does it too. And he's like, have you heard the lyrics? And I'm like, no, it's just good tunes. Like I like the beat. Like I was never into the lyrics. I always just liked the beat because of what I've learned from you. I have now thought it doesn't matter if I like the beat what's going into my ear is a temple of the Holy spirit. And is it feeding my soul? Yeah. And it's not. It's good. So yeah. thank you because it, you have challenged so me. Yeah. It has to do with eating, exercising, what you take into your body. It also has to do with how you use your phone because your body speaks. So if you're in front of somebody and you're scrolling, your body's speaking right then saying, I don't care about you. I don't honor you. But so other image bearers deserve our honor. So then it depend, It changes how we interact with each other. It changes how we choose to use our rest time. Are we resting, giving our body what we need because our bodies were made for a reason and it's not for self-expression, but God expression on every level. And so it's a real discipleship tool for ourselves and our kids to not make sex the big deal, but it then puts sex in the right place um, in terms of being image bearers, whether you get married or you're single, mm -hmm. all of it is for God's glory. Well, Francie, let's take this further. I'm sure that we have wet the appetite for so many of our listeners yes. who are like, okay, wait, why did Clinton Sherry bring that up right now? Like, gosh, dang it. We had four minutes left and they brought that up. Like, seriously, they have I to have her back so they on. they want more. Yeah, they do. They do. I mean, I want more for sure. This is good stuff. So Francie, how can our listeners get more? I mean, is it going to be heaven in your home? What can they do to plug into what you're doing? How can they learn about what you've done, what you're going to do next? All of that. I would love them to join me on the Heaven in Your Home podcast. I suggest in starting episode one because I start with my story and um, I do go a little like on the crazy deep side sometimes, but I have found that like God is just continually renewing. It's like deep, high, deep, high, shallow, all over the place because it all blends together because God wants to radically renew our minds and our thinking, not just so that we have like a new tip to apply, but so that we become new creation with new thinking in this Babylonian world we live in where the culture's gone nuts. And so um, I encourage you to start episode one because they do build. And then, so that would be a fun invitation to have you join in the conversation. And then the discipleship circle is really more of a relationally deeper level where you get more me and you get monthly calls with me and um, that I take the content of the podcast up to a deeper level in more of like a monthly Bible study format where you can unpack it and really take it to your time with the Lord or with a small group. And so my heart is to continually um, rolling out those two things and then connecting with people on social media when I'm on there um, would be great. Those are awesome. Yes. That is so good. I feel like, yeah, no, I have listened to your podcast and it's like, you go deep and I love that. You know, you are not, I think our world craves depth right now. There's so many surface level things, so many tips, so many inspirational movies and, and motivational this and that. And, and I think those things have their place for sure. I'm not trying to use a weird tone of voice to degrade those. But what I am saying is I love that you are like, Hey, that's where we start. And then we can go deeper. And in that discipleship, and that's what I love you focus on is not just, Hey, let's just like change our behaviors or change this thought, but let's go really deep and let's enter into that space where it will change everything we do. And yeah. I'm grateful you're doing that. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be with you guys. You guys inspire me. I'm so grateful for the story of God written in you and through you and how he's using your story as bravely as you're willing to share it. It's so courageous to really shift other marriages because it's about, it's about transformation on every level. And so thank you guys for saying yes to God. Mm. Thank you. Appreciate it.